So I'm very excited to talk about some stuff that's just captivated me for the last few years of my PhD, really made me finish my dissertation. And uh, so what we're going to talk about today is the hidden data flow of type. So basically what we're going to do, we're going to give it a one slide introduction of what a type system is. I actually don't presume you know what a type system is, so I'll do my best to, to convey that. Then we're going to look at what, a, what is a data flow in a, in a program. And then, well, how do types and data flows interact? And why would you even care about it? I mean, it, it sounds cool in concept, but in practice, why would you even care about it? So type systems. Once you've written down a program like this, this piece of closure, which, I don't know, it's a bit of garbage, it, it doesn't really matter. It's got parens, it's a program, it probably runs. But what you want to do at this point, once you've run it, you want to learn if it will run correctly. So what a static type system will do, will, it analyzes your program without running it and tells you, well, it depends on the type system, and it tells you particular properties of the type system. And often what you do is you start off specifying what you expect the, the, the program to do. So you have this specification in terms of a type, which is also similarly a bunch of symbols, but it basically says that I expect this function to be able to take these sorts of things and return those sorts of things. And what, the, what, a, static, what a static type system does is that it compares the implementation of this type uh, by something, via something called static type checking and effectively figures out if your program agrees with the type. So you say this program's supposed to do all this stuff and then the, type, the static type checker will, without running a program, tell you if your program actually conforms to that type. So there's plenty of different ways of implementing a type system. We're just going to have a very simple view here. There are, there are two kinds of type systems. The first is uses global type inference. You might have also heard it under different names like Hindley-Milner unification-based inference or let polymorphism is something associated with this. Uh, languages like Haskell, F-sharp, Flow, and OCaml are all based basically in this, in this vein. And I'm saying that's one kind of type system for the purposes of this talk. And the other kind is a bidirectional type checker. And you've almost definitely used a, 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 a type system, sorry, if you've used a type system, you've almost definitely used one that uh, is bidirectional because it's becoming very popular in the last few decades. So languages like Java and TypeScript and Scala all use bidirectional checking. So what does that even mean? Like these two arbitrary categories. So let's talk about how global type inference works or Henley Milner. I'm certainly not an expert in this particular subject, but I'll do my best. So a highly simplified view of how global type inference works is if we have this program and we want to check it, uh, we want to type check it, the first thing we do is we go through the program and, and, annot and label each part of the program with type variables. And you can see, but just look, looking at the structure of this program, the uh, expressions are related to each other in interesting ways. Sometimes uh, values get passed from one function to another, and we can we can represent these relationships in uh, in what's called a constraint. So the next step is to derive constraints between the parts of the program, and the idea is now that we have a bunch of um, equality constraints and we can solve them using unification. And if we can find a, a substitution for this, uh, for this constraint using unification, for all these constraints using unification, then we can, we can say that it's type safe, this, this particular piece of code. And yeah, so this is all about generating constraints and figuring out how to solve them. And bidirectional checking on the other hand is, is very different. And bidirectional type checking has two different modes. The first is an inference mode, and the other is a check mode. And there's sort of two directions of arrows. Inference uh, says that we're pushing types back up the syntax tree, and checking says we're pushing types down. And what that means is that we're effectively going to walk this piece of syntax and push types in or, or let them propagate out. And we always have to be in one of these modes. So to type check this function, we have to, we have, to have something to work with. There's no way to 
in bidirectional checking, where there's no way to conjure up the type of a function from nothing. And this is like a, a strength and a weakness of bidirectional checking, is that you need to always annotate your functions. So this annotation up here was something that you would have to write if you, um, if you were to type check this particular program. And the idea is that now the bidirectional checker has something to work with. So we start like in checking mode for this, with this function, and then um, there are, we can switch into inference mode uh, just using local information. And the general idea is that we, you, uh, you provide enough global information so you only need to do local reasoning. Okay, so hopefully that's, that's a whirlwind, whirlwind tour of the two different kinds of, of type systems you might see in the world. Um, but let's, let's try and um, push the state of the art for, for these two types of uh, type systems. So what's hard, about, what's hard in extending a global type inference? So it turns out that this thing called subtyping is, is difficult to incorporate with uh, global type inference. And subtyping is a, a sort of a polymorphism. It effectively allows you, you to type check the same expression at multiple types. So you, you can, this, uh, this rule over here says that an int is, um, any value that is of type int can be used where you're expecting a number. And uh, you can have many subtyping judgments, uh, rules, like you can say the int can be an object as well, and this looks a lot like object-oriented programming. And it, indeed, if you want to have support for object orientation, you're going to need something like subtyping or something that emulates subtyping uh, in your in your type system. And so, sort of the the way to look at a subtyping judgment is the thing on the left is more specific, and the thing on the right is less specific. And I like this example here of. of uh, forgetting keys in a record. So this says that um, if you have a record that has two entries, an A and a B, then you can use that in a context that only requires an A. And you can see that there's more information on the left, like there's more text, and there's more on the right. At least that helps my brain thinking about it. But there's a big problem uh, using subtyping with global type inference, and that is that we can no longer use unification we're gonna to have to find some other way of solving these constraints. And that, I mean, that was step two or three, I, I can't remember. But it was, it's a big part of, of, of global type inference. So we're gonna to have to find some other way to solve these constraints using, um, if we're gonna incorporate subtyping with global type inference. Okay, so on the other hand, what's hard about bidirectional type checking? Well, the, the way that bidirectional type checking is set up is that uh, whenever there's something hard, like, for example, like what the type of X is here, the, the type checker says, well, you just give me the annotation. So there's a lot of manual labor in terms of, um, of using bidirectional type checking. But this is super frustrating. If you look at this uh, expression here, this is mapping the identity function over this uh, collection. Well, it's pretty obvious what the type of X is. Like, it's, it's right here, it's all these numbers. So why can't a type system figure it out? So, uh, and, and if the type of X is, uh, is less precise, then the type of the return value is gonna be less precise, so everyone loses. So let's look at some real world type systems and see how they deal with this particular program. So type racket says that X is of type any. That's that's kind of annoying, because any is the most useless type that you can have. Alternatively, TypeScript has this very similar looking type, and in fact, the opposite type called any, which is the most useful type you can have. In fact, it's a backdoor into the type system. So you, you basically get punished. If you don't want to annotate your Lambda, well, you're gonna have a backdoor in your type system propagate through your program, and good luck. There's another approach called dynamic typing, which has a dynamic type, and this type implicitly has runtime coercions. So whenever you need to use it. So whenever you open up this list and start using things, you're gonna pay runtime. Like your program will run slower because the type system couldn't figure out that X was an int. Really annoying. 
So what is going on here? This looks really easy. Well, it turns out we're trying to do two things at once. So the way that uh, this expression is type checked in most bidirectional checking is you first figure out what the type of the function is, and it's a polymorphic function. So the way to, to figure out the return value, the, sorry, the return type of this expression is that we have to figure out what this beta is over here. And the way to do that is you first type check the arguments and then you sort of overlay them onto these, uh, these type variables and you figure out the type variables. But like if we're trying to, oh, I skipped that, but sorry. <laughs> but if you remember in solving these type variables, I said we have to type check this. So we're sort of in, in the middle of trying to figure out these alphas and betas we have to also figure out the x. So there's sort of a chicken and an egg problem here because you can see that um, there's, there's potentially, well, the, sort of the crux of the talk is that there's a lot of information in here and we're too busy type checking the arguments to, to, to link it up. I'll make that a little more concrete in a few minutes. Okay, so We've seen a couple of frustrating things with Hindley-Milner style or uh, global type inference, uh, adding subtyping to it, and also um, the annoying amount of local annotations you need to have with bidirectional checking. So let's kind of take a left turn and think about data flows and programs and then link it up to solve both of these problems. So let's look at this. Uh, classic bit of Lisp that of course reads right to left and the, this has two data flows in it, well at least if we're from the perspective of G, uh, we're passing 42 as an input to G and then G is, G's output flows to, uh, to F's input and so the, this, is, so, <laughs> this is taking me a while to, uh, to grok but the way to think about an input is Whenever an input, uh, so an input to G moves us into the definition of G, and an output from G moves us away from the definition of G. So, and that doesn't necessarily mean that the only outputs you can have are return values. Like, it, it gets more interesting. So if we move our attention to F, then it's the same deal, like the inputs to F, move us into the definition of F, or at least the execution, we're executing the body, then any outputs makes us leave the body of F. And if we have another way of looking at this is this data flow goes from G's output to F's input, and if we visualize G's definition on the, on the left here and F on the right, then we're, uh, we're moving uh, there's a couple of ways of, of, of thinking about this. I like to think of it as sort of G giving F the, the, the ability to execute code or the, 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 the thread of execution. And it does this by sending it a message. And you can, yet another way of looking at it is through uh, the, the type signatures of G and F. So if, if G has type A to B and F has type B to C, then we can pass the output of G to the input of F because the Bs are the same. But notice there's some extra annotations at the top here, the inputs and outputs. And the way that these are calculated is uh, if by default everything is an output and if you're to the left of an arrow, it's an input. But what happens if we have multiple arrows? Well, this is where it really gets fun. So let's look at the quintessential higher order function again, map, uh, that takes a function and an input, and the, the, the main feature of map is that all of these uh, collect, variable, all these values in the collection get, get sent to, to F. And the way to visualize that with this uh, sort of split screen is if we're in the definition of map, we have values that we want to send to, to F. So we send values to F and F is executing. And then F has finished executing uh, and has values ready to send back to map. So map. Map has the, um, 
we're back to executing maps in maps definition. This will, this will be easier to, to grasp in, in, a, in a subsequent example. But now the question is, what, what are the, yeah, are these inputs or outputs, these, uh, a, this A, R, or B? So this is the, the type signature of map. A, R, or B takes A's and returns B's. And there's a, a simple algorithm to figure this out. If you have uh, one arrow, as we saw before, if you're to the left of the arrow, it's an input. If you're to the right of the arrow, it's an output. And then what happens when you're the, to the left of multiple arrows, every time you go to the left of an arrow, you flip. So uh, A is going to be an output here because it's to the left of two arrows. So if you're to the left of an even number of arrows, you're an output. If you're to the left of an odd number of arrows, you're an input, because notice that B in this second example is an input. And if we just keep iterating here, see A is now an input again, and if we iterate again, A is now an output. And remember, an output means that we're delegating execution to someone else. Input means that we're getting a value so that we can start executing. So how does this relate back to map? Um, so, because this A here is to the left of two arrows, this means it's an output, and this B is an input. So, this is sort of the, the cool part of the talk, uh, the, the, the insight, which is there's a very simple algorithm to figure out the data flows. All those fancy arrows that I was drawing before on expressions, you get the same arrows from this just by following a simple rule. So for every type variable here, if you draw an arrow from an input to an output, that's going to be a data flow that's potentially there in any implementation. So let's do it for A. Let's draw an, uh, an arrow from the input to the output. And here's the, the characteristic way of calling map. We're piping in the inputs of the collection to, uh, sorry, we're piping the collection into the, the function. And if we do the same for, for B, Let's connect up the input to the output. Well, that's the other half of map. Map's going to return a list of the results of f. Now, this floored me when I saw it first. Uh, is, I, think, I still think this is crazy. Because if you type check a program that has this type, then it can't have, it, it guarantees basically that these uh, these are the, the, the data flows between the arguments. These are the relationships between the arguments. And the, the, it was sort of like seeing something in black and white and then seeing it in color. Like before it was just like a flat piece of text and now there's, there's another dimension to it. But let, let's look at, at, at an even more interesting uh, argument, uh, sorry, even more interesting higher order function that has in, more intricate uh, relationships between its parameters. So comp is function composition between uh, two functions, f and g. And the way to compose functions is you, you return a lambda, and then th once you call the lambda, you call it on the, the, the right thing, and then you, you propagate it to the left thing. And yeah, comp works right to left. So from the perspective of comp, this x here is an input. This is someone calling this function and giving comp the ability to execute the way uh, its body, the, the way that it wants to. And then what comp is doing is it's delegating the execution to G. So it's saying that G can have the uh, ability to execute now. And then what happens is G gives us back a value. So we're back in the definition of comp. Then comp says, well, I'm going to out, out output a value to f. Now f is running, and f um, gives us back an input, and then we can output a, a value to, the, to whoever called this lambda. So these are the data flows with, if we're looking at the program. So uh, if, you, if you didn't quite follow that, this is a, um, this is this, with the three parties, comp, f, and g, we start in uh, the definition of comp, and then uh, g executes, and then we're back in comp, and then f executes, and we're back in comp. 
But how does this relate to, um, to this type signature? Well, let's just start drawing our arrows. So let's start with A. Let's draw an arrow from the input to the output. So this is the first data flow that we talked about where we passed X to G. And if we talk about B, draw an input to output, this is the second data flow where the result of G is being passed to F. And then third data flow connecting up C's input to output is the, the final data flow and um, that returns to whoever called the, the, the lambda in the first place. All right, so that's, that's a little bit of background about how to see the data flows and types. Now, other than the fact that this is, I, I think this is crazy awesome and, and really fun, and you should all try it at home, try your, find your favorite function and do this. And if it's both an input and an output, then I'll give you a dissertation to read to figure it out. <laughs> there's, there's a little bit of, yeah. <laughs> So how can figuring out the data flows in a type help us in adding subtyping to global type inference? So the, the, as you might imagine, the story is, is very complicated and, and long. I'm just going to um, concentrate on one thing, um, is that uh, this, this particular type system called ML sub represent types as finite state machines. And we saw a lot of arrows that were basically flows. And you can, you can sort of imagine what we might come up against. And I, I'm, I'll try my best to, to, to summarize how to do this. So one remarkable thing about this type system, ML sub, is if, if we look at this function choose, so here's the documentation string for choose. Returns either the first or second argument. So it could just return the first argument, could return the second, could be a branch that you know, checks a random number or a quality or something like that. But here are two identical type signatures in term, from the perspective of ML sub. And it's still hard to believe for me that these are identical. Because the first one says, it takes two A's and returns an A. And you can, you can imagine, you can make A broad enough to be able to, to fit both of the arguments. So that, that makes sense. But this second one looks so precise. You, it takes an A and a B and returns either an A or a B. But these are apparently the same. <laughs> And we can see how by drawing the data flows in and, and building what's called a type automaton, and I'm not going to draw any finite state machines, uh, but I'm going to draw something that's in between. Uh, it's called a type automaton, and it's, a, it's effectively a prettier way of drawing the diagrams that we, we saw before. So to draw a type automaton, you uh, effectively turn the syntax of your type into a tree. So the root of the tree is the arrow, we have an input A, another input A, and an output A, so the, the three parts of this type. And then we, we, uh, we choose our, our we, we follow our simple algorithm. For every type variable, we draw an arrow, which is a, a flow, from the input to the output. So for the first argument goes input to output, and then the second argument is input to output. So what about the second type? Well. Here's, the, uh, here's the, the syntax tree. Let's draw an arrow from the input to the output. Input to output, input to output. So it turns out that the way that ML sub decides subtyping is that it compares the data flows. That there's actually no type variables stored in these uh, automata. And effectively, to figure out if a, a type is a subtype of another type, we compare the data flows. Now this example is a little silly because it's, it's exactly the same, but in general the algorithm is take the data flow on the right and overlay it with the one on the left and then trim, trim away any redundant data flows and if the result of that is equal to the one on the right, then they're subtypes. 
So this is my crude way of, of summarizing that. Just overlay the, the two types. And if the data flows are the same, which they are, but I, tr yeah. <laughs> then there are subtypes. So, yeah. So th th that's how data flows can help us. Uh, yeah, so it's not entirely obvious how to link it up with uh, how to make global type inference and subtyping uh, work together. But in a few slides, I'll, yeah, I'll give you the dissertation and you can read the rest. But I think this, I would read a dissertation based on that. This, yeah. and, and there's pretty pictures in it as well. Okay, so let's move on to bidirectional type checking. Why would you care about the, the data flows when you're trying to use bidirectional type checking to, to check a program? And this is uh, some of my research. Uh, and yeah, so it's, it's a little harder to talk about. I can't make sweeping statements. Okay, so let's go back to this really annoyingly difficult to check uh, uh, piece of code with bidirectional checking. We have this obvious data flow um, where numbers are flowing into X and the result of X flows into the output of, of this entire um, expression. And when we look at the type of map and we draw out our inputs and outputs, if we follow our little algorithm, we can find exactly the same um, data flows. So, you know, it seems like all the information is there to be able to figure out that we need to link up the one, two, three with the, uh, with the type of X. And again, the, the limitation is that we're trying to find the value, uh, the, the, the instantiation of beta here, but, uh, but in the process of, of, of trying to find the alpha and beta here, where we also type check the, um, the arguments. So, and we, uh, in type checking these arguments, we've asked the type checker to guess the type of X. So this is bad because we saw that the guesses of the type systems before were, were terrible. Very annoying. Okay, so uh, my solution to this is to combine uh, symbolic execution with type inference. So effectively, uh, my idea is to uh, massage the program a little so then it's easier to type check. And the idea is that we're adding a new sort of, of type to our type system, and it is perhaps the craziest type I've ever, ever seen in my life. Uh, it, se it still seems a little silly. I'm not sure if it's a good idea, but damn it if it's cool. The type is just the expression. Well, it is, it's not quite true. But effectively, it's pausing the type checker, it, checking at a particular point. So the idea is if we type check this first argument, we, we realize that we need to guess a type. So we just sort of like freeze the type. And we say that, well, this, the type of the first argument is the paused type checking at, the po at this point because we don't have any input. So we're gonna wait until we get better values than nothing uh, uh, to, to insert as the type of X. And then, well, the second argument's a little easier to type check. It's just a factor of ints. Um, so now the question is, when do we need to unpause type checking and how on earth are we gonna do it? And we're gonna look at the data flows of the types to figure that out. So first off, just looking at this type signature, you can see that if you have a beta, you must have had an alpha, so there's a dependency. So we need alphas to, um, to, to kick off this type checking. So we happen to have an alpha over here, this int. So we can kick off alpha as int. And now we can start using our data flows. We draw an arrow from an input to an output, and we realize that we actually have an input for our function. So we can resume type checking at this point with the information that x is an int. And we can just sort of, now the hard part's over, we just need to sort of plug everything back together. This x 
is now the, uh, the type of, of beta, and I guess it's int. And then the data flow says that this is the, the output of beta here. And this uh, list of betas is the, uh, sorry, it's going to be a list of ints, is the, the type of the overall expression. So what's happening here is that we're selectively pausing type checking and then using the data flows to figure out how to resume them again. And this is on the order of execution of the program. This is undecidable. But you can read my dissertation on uh, more reasons why this is a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> but it's only undecidable if the program doesn't terminate. No, it's, it, it's undecidable in other ways as well. But if it terminates, it's a pretty good chance. <laughs> like, look, this, this terminates. <laughs> But you can imagine if a type system had just a rule that was, uh, if we figured out a heuristic, like, oh, if it has two or three arrows, or if there isn't a cycle, or something like that, um, that that's sort of the next step in my, in my research, is figuring out what sort of, uh, how to restrict this crazy undecidable solution so that, um, so that it, it behaves nicely in a way that you'd actually want in a type system. Okay, so, well, uh, talk's wrapping up. Let's see the references. If you're interested in these sorts of diagrams that combine global type inference and subtyping, check out um, Stephen Dolan's PhD thesis. It's on ML sub. It's called Algebraic Subtyping. And you can see arrows going in the, in the opposite direction now. Uh, this is actually something I didn't cover. Um, but if you're interested in uh, combining bidirectional checking and um, uh, symbolic execution, uh, I've got a bit written about that in my recent PhD thesis, and that's ongoing work as well. Okay, so let's conclude. So this type of map, when I, just looking at it, it's, um, it, there's definitely more than meets the eye going on here. And my favorite example of this is the reduce function. So let's, let's just conclude this talk by looking at all the ways that we can extract information just by looking at the type of reduce. So reduce takes a reducing function and an initial value and a list of things to reduce over, and it returns a, uh, the result of the reduction. And if we count the arrows like we did before, uh, if it's to the left of an even number of arrows, it's an output. If it's to the left of an odd number of arrows, it's an input. Then we get these inputs and outputs. So now uh, we we can we can look at the uh, what data flows fall out of this. So let's start linking up. So this alpha goes to this alpha because it's an input to an output, and this is kicking off the reduction with an, in, an initial value to the reducing function. And similarly, this beta has to also uh, be passed because it takes two arguments. So this is just connecting up inputs to outputs. I spoiled one. And this next one is, it says that the return of the reduction function can contribute to the output of the reduce, which that's how reduce works. And this one says that we can just return the initial value. And that's one way that, uh, that reduce can work. If we have an empty list, then we can just re return the initial value. And this one, this arrow says that we can iterate the reducing function. And th this one's the crazy one. Uh, this is the sort of, oh my god, undecidable arrow. And it goes just the, the same input to output, but we can iterate this, uh, this reducing function on its own output. And yeah, that's how re it reduce works. So there's a lot of information there, but this is sort of like a starting point. And just starting from here is, is, is what uh, makes me so excited about figuring out what, what's possible using all this information. Like, I'm just gonna, close off my talk with like uh, one tra uh, train of thought. Like for example, look at the, the, the big overarching arrow. It says that beta 
is fed into the second argument of this reducing function. But we can have a list of betas. So it's possible that there are no betas to, to, to pass over. So let's say that this flow is not possible. Let's say that we have an empty list. Well, if it's not possible to send beta over, then, well, it's not possible to also apply this data flow, this alpha, because, well, we can't invoke the reducing function. Well, if we can't invoke the reducing function, we can't return a value from the reducing function to the reduce. And if we can't return a value from the reduce, well, we, can't, we certainly can't iterate reduce. And all that's left is the only thing that reduce could possibly do on an empty list. You just return the initial value. All right, that's all I got. <laughs> So when you were talking about the f sort of freezing the type checking and then reviving it, that kind of reminded me of the concept of an any type, right? Because it kind of feels like you're saying, let this type be any type for now, and then we'll come back and fill it in. Is that kind of a reasonable way to look at it? The way that I think about it is that we're building up an intersection type. So we start off, um, yeah, you're right. So an empty intersection type is any. Any type. Yep. Just like the empty union is bottom, and I actually... I didn't learn that until a few years after I implemented type closure, so it was an embarrassing commit somewhere. But, <clears throat> but the idea is that we've frozen type checking and we can type, re-type check the body multiple times if we can unfreeze it multiple times. And we're effectively just putting multiple intersection types, uh, we're figuring out multiple inputs and outputs. And that's what happens is that if you, uh, you know, if you have a, if you invoke the, the function with an int, you, you know, get int to int, and then you uh, invoke it again with a bool, you get a bool to bool. And that's sort of the relationship to intersection type systems, which is undecidable, which I don't, I don't fully understand. Intersection type systems to me is a little opaque because it's, it's a little more theoretical uh, than, than most type systems. Uh, but that's at least the vague... Uh, like, oh, that's why it's undecidable. Just um, to clarify, um, undecidable at compile time? Yes, yeah. because it effectively, every time you calculate an intersection, you're invoking the function. So if you, well, th th that, this, this loop here uh, from alpha to alpha is sort of the problem, because <laughs> you need to find some sort of fixed point. Um, and if you do it naively, you're going to just keep symbolically executing and grabbing a whole bunch of information, but you're never going to end. Um, so I'm, there's probably a way to, to end, but I haven't figured it out. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah, at the back. Um, the identity function over int and the identity function over bool have the same data flow, but they're different types, right? Um, so the, 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 the data flow if we're just talking about looking at the type, it only makes sense when you have type variables. Okay. So if it's int to int, bool to bool, you can't say that it's gonna be exactly the same int um, that's returned is the one that you input. But if you, if you have type variables, then that is exactly what it says. Right. At least in a lot of type systems. Hey, so this might be an embarrassing question, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, when you were describing the type of map and the best that some type systems could come up with, was effectively any or yeah. that sort of thing. When you put that into Scala, it comes up with, like it'll come up with the int to int thing. Yeah, yeah. Is Scala using some of this or something like some, is it cheating? Like how, how does that relate to yeah. the thing you're talking about? I think I tried to input this program into Scala and um, it works when you use method chaining. But for example, if you let bind the, um, uh, the function, like, Scala needs to know the type of the function before it um, checks the body. Um, so, the, like, Java is, is amazing at this stuff. You can't, like, you can chain things and, you know, until you fall asleep, and you don't need to add an annotation. And I think it's to do with the method chaining. But um, sort of the generalization of, um, like, you can imagine let binding the identity function uh, in the, the map identity. And so it's map foo. 
And then you, you really, no bidirectional checker is going to figure that out because you really need to pause type checking uh, or somehow have some heuristic to, to not type check the lambda because type checking proceeds from the outside to the in. So yeah, the Scala does really well in idiomatically Scala code, but of course, um, writing closure code in Scala is, you know, unsurprisingly, it, it, it doesn't work out as well. Um, Thanks. Which, you know, it doesn't matter to Scala programs. <laughs> like your guess. Yep. So the stuff about how this only works if you have type variables, because otherwise you can just like magic up a bool or an int and yeah. ignore your inputs. That sounds kind of like the theorems for free stuff. Yeah. I, is there a connection there? Like you're taking a different perspective to infer data flows more than just look at implementations? Yeah. Like following back the literature on the like type automata, I, I can't find any, any uh, references back to uh, free theorems. But when I first, like I kind of reverse engineered this myself and figured out like, has someone else done this? And what effectively happened was, um, it, it seemed like every, every one of these arrows was a straightforward corollary from the free theorems of the type. Um, that's, that isn't something that I have proven, but it seems like if, if you can derive this sort of stuff from the type, surely the free theorem tells you. Um, and that's as far as I've gotten. <laughs> so I'm sure that this is just a, a simpler version uh, of, of starting from the free theorem. And, uh, and trying to extract, extract sort of redundant, odd-looking information. I think that that's sort of the novelty, uh, or that's the part that, that jumps out to me, that this looks dumb uh, and, and easy, uh, to, to me at least. Um, that, that isn't the right way of saying it. <laughs> it's more that, like, great, you drew a bunch of arrows, now what? And it's really surprising that there are actually uh, applications. And, yeah. All right, um, if that's all we've got, um, thank you very much, Ambrose.